A couple months ago, I, I fell asleep and I had a dream. And as uh, so often you fall asleep and you have dreams and you don't remember what you, you, you dreamt about the night before. But this dream was different because I remembered in, in some detail what had happened that night. So here's, here's, this, here's the plot line behind the dream. I was running for president. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, uh, and so, yeah, and so I was running for president, and then I didn't want to run for president, but I was forced to run for president, and so all of a sudden, I've got to come up with a platform. So what do I run on? I don't know. And so, so going back and forth with my advisors, I decided to run on a platform that's biblical. It's a house divided, cannot stand. Let's bring agreement and stop being so divided as a country because if we, unless we stop being divided, we're going we're gonna to fall, we're going to fail. And so uh, it's interesting that there's been so much media coverage on us, on, on, the, on the election, it just, you can't avoid it, you can't get away from it. The, uh, there is a lot at stake this coming Tuesday. These are things that you know that you might have been like me, stressed out over the last six, eight, twelve months, wondering who in the world, how in the world, what in the world. <laughs> but there's issues of the economy and wanting to grow strong and people having jobs and, and there's the issue of the national debt. We are, it's really irresponsible and we're gonna, it's gonna get us unless we find a way to, to make a balanced budget. Uh, taxes. Uh, it's, living month to month and it's hard to, to make ends meet all the time and, and the government wants a lot of that. Uh, health care, the average cost of health care premiums increased this, this year is 25 percent. That's massive. Uh, there's the issue of abortion and women's rights and, and unborn babies and their lives and then there's a matter of education and we're, we seem to be falling behind the rest of the world as far as the quality of education here. There's religious freedom issues at stake. What can you say? What can't you say? As a church, what can I? What can we say? What can I say as a pastor? And there, there might be more and more Christian organizations that are being granted hate organizations because they believe in, in what the family and God's definition of the family. Uh, there's terrorism. We we had too many people die this last year, whether it be France or Belgium or Florida, there's so many terrorist attacks, we need someone that's going to keep us safe. There's gun rights. Are the guns the problem? Are they the solution? Uh, what do we need to do there? And then we all have the, have the looming issue of the Supreme Court, and we've got a justice immediately. One of the first things that the, president, the new president's going to do is nominate a new judge. There's so much at stake this Tuesday. There's so much riding on this election. You don't need me to tell you that. I'm just reminding you of that, because if you're like me, even Again, you've been freaked out about this for quite some time. There are some pastors who have come out and endorsed a particular candidate or, or they've said you ought to vote this way or that way. And I've, I've chosen a different approach. I want to try to, I want to, try to go to work God's word for comfort. <laughs> so, uh, so this morning I want to talk about a November 8th survival guide. Amen. And so if you've been sweating bullets, you've been freaking out, you've been concerned, you don't know what's going to happen, and there's fear and anxiety about the future, then I hope this is encouraging to you. It's also a hard one for me because I like to worry, and so I've been having a field day, but God's plan is not for us to worry. There are, there are three things in, in particular that we'll look at. These are on the back of your bulletin if you'd like to take notes. Uh, God is, government is, and we are. So three facts that should help release some anxiety. And we're going to be looking at Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. Let's pick it up in Romans 13, 1. The first point is that God is, God is in control. That's the first point. God is in control. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority that has been which God had, except that which God has established. There's been no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. So the first point, God is in control. It says there clearly there's no authority except that which God has established. There's no accidental government right now. That God has allowed every single government to be in control that's in control. And every authority that's in place has been established by God. 
Isn't that hard to it's, isn't that hard to believe? If it wasn't in scripture, I wouldn't believe it. <laughs> it's like, well, God hasn't seen the candidates they're putting forward this year. Or, you know, I can't believe it. It's like, but the thing about it, as a Christian, we believe that God causes the earth to spin at just a certain rate, so many thousands of miles an hour, he brings the seasons. There's an internal war between uh, bacteria and your immune system that's going on in your body right now, and there's microbes, and there's all these things that are happening. There's, there's that whole animal kingdom that's going on of, of predator and prey. And it's okay, we can trust, you know, maybe the, the bird just got, eaten by, just got eaten by the alligator. God's in control of that, but the politics is a different issue. And so it's almost like we'll, set, we'll like segregate nature or segregate things where it's easy because uh, we're not worried about it unless you're a bird lover. That's easy to, to say God's in control of that. But then when you look at the government, it's like, well, we're in control. That's us. That's me. I got to vote. I get one vote. I can solve it. Uh, so we need to believe that God is God's in control. Uh, the flip side of it, we just we just talked to many of you are feeling this. What what does it what does it look like when we refuse to accept God's sovereignty? If we feel like that God's plan is going to be thwarted if the wrong person is elected on Tuesday, what, what does that do to you? What does that do to me? Panic, fear. Uh, I've been having trouble sleeping at night, and that would compound it, <laughs> for sure. Um, high blood pressure, anxiety. If you, if you look on social media, you, you see a whole lot of that, don't you? Haven't you heard the water cooler talk and so-and-so? And, you know, it's funny, there's a, I like my favorite news source is the BBC, because they constantly talk about how crazy Americans are, <laughs> from a somewhat impartial perspective. <clears throat> And they're interviewing people as far as what they're going to do, and they're going to, you know, you name your country. Now, for me, it's Brazil, because my family already has Brazilian citizenship. Okay. Uh, but maybe Canada, Mexico, you know, flee the country if, if your candidate doesn't, doesn't get chosen. Um, take alternative measures, try to, I don't know, make things in court. But we're not in control. And to forget the fact that God's in control is to invite worry and fear anxiety and frustration. Uh, to me, I get a little frustrated because it is easy for me to believe God's in control except for the government. But as, if, we, if we trust that he's in control, we're going to feel so much better. So that's the first point. God is in control, even if it doesn't look like it. The second, government is God's idea. Government is God's idea. That comes from Romans 13, verses 2 to 4. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. So did, did you catch that where it said, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted? There are three institutions that God has ordained for us, three social institutions. The first is the family. And so you see right away you have Adam and Eve. And, and for this reason, a man shall separate from his, his uh, parents and cleave to his wife. And so you have the family is a sacred institution which we should protect, which, God, which is God ordained. That's a particular passion of mine because so much of the trouble that we're in comes from families that are broken apart. You have children that are being raised in, in homes where they don't have the love of their parents. Uh, one parent is absent. And this happens to people of no, of no fault of their own in many, many cases. And sometimes people just make mistakes. But the family is God's plan to raise children and populate the earth. That's one institution. Another institution is the church. 
And this is where we come together as believers united by God and by Christ. This is where we administer the sacraments. This is a holy, divinely ordained body that we have right here in the church. And then the last is the government. It says here that God has instituted government. And so what does the government do? Good question. Sometimes nothing, right? That's, that's kind of the way that we feel. If you took a public opinion poll on the street today, we would, we'd say the government's not doing its job, they're taking time off, there'd be all this negativity towards them. However, they do things. They just do things that we don't like, right? Much of it. They're God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. I don't want an agent of wrath in my life, right? That's not, not something that I'm, I'm going to be a big fan of. But it's important for that to be there. That part of, part of what the government does and the, is to enforce the law. Uh, yeah. uh, there, there's some things I disagree with. Uh, one being that the street Galloway should not be 35 miles an hour. That's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's like you go down belt, belt line and it's 45. But to be 35 is a main main fair. It's like, what, what's going on here? Why in the world? Who set this law? It's ridiculous. Uh, I know someone here, at least one person, was recently pulled over. <laughs> We're going 50. <laughs> and I think. $200 donation. <laughs> <laughs> and so, if we we're smart, we'll try to be careful and not speed. And I used to be a, a chronic speeder. And, and you know, because you're going, you're going over, I wasn't like terrible, but I'm, you know, you're 16, and what do you do when you're 16? You're like so excited to get in the car and not have your parents right in there next to you and you test the limits of what you can do. Uh, but, but when you don't speed, you don't, you don't fear. And so, like the scripture says, we don't have, we don't have a fear of those when you're doing right. And so, but still, 35, like I accidentally go 35, I almost run 35. And so, anyway. Uh, but can you, can you imagine if that was the Audubon, how horrible that would be? That there's no law. Uh, I, love, I love my children so much. And, and you know, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a father. I'm going to work it in his illustration in the sermon. Yes, I am that pastor that can't stop talking about his kids because he thinks they're so darn cute. Because they are. But we, uh, they're, they're amazing. And I love to sit and watch them. And they, they say the darndest thing, and they're really cute, and they're growing up too fast, and we tell them to stop growing, but they don't listen. Uh, and they're, they're amazing. Uh, we have a Bible study on parenting. Uh, Camille and I have a neighborhood Bible study on parenting. And it was recently, we had uh, three families that were there. There were six adorable little toddler boys that were there. And, and so... Yeah, Camille and I and the other two couples were watch, trying to watch the video. And we had the six kids in the other room, in the playroom. And you just kind of know, uh, you're not naive parents like we are. You know what's going to happen. And so every minute or two, it probably took us an hour and a half to go through 20 minutes of film. And so, okay, Satan say, will stop punching Jonah. You can't do that. No, no, give him the toy, no biting, no climbing. Don't smash the fragile piece of furniture or whatever. And so constantly, uh, this this is the this is anarchy. This is the cutest, it's the cutest picture of anarchy I can think of. But that's that's what happens if there's not government. Is you have kind of a wild west scenario where there's no rules, just whoever might makes right and it's ugly. And, and so there is a very specific reason why God gives governments, and that is to bring order, to protect life, to preserve life. For a sober perspective, you can look no further. You don't have to look any further than Iraq or Syria or Afghanistan. Because you have here an area where you depose one ruler and there's a vacuum and it's an anarchy. And you have something as hideous as ISIS that pops up. And the kinds of atrocities they're doing is unthinkable. And so, God, we should really respect our governments because it's God has ordained these. And we are to honor, respect, and obey them. And it's hard that this last week... Several people in the church, uh, we, uh, we found out we want to replace a sign, right? Everyone want to replace a sign that's broken. And 
we're excited about that. So we, we, we submit for a permit, $100, okay, we'll do that. They come out, and I found out from Tom and Byron, who were just coming from the city, that we've got to build a $7,000 wall around our dumpster. And so it's like, don't we want to remove the blighted sign? <laughs> like, isn't that doing the city a favor? And yet they want to do that. And they think we're made of money and just like, and so it's, it feels like such a burden sometimes. Uh, we did not, as part of our budgeting process, we did not budget in a $7,000 wall around our dumpster. We just didn't see that as a real pressing need for us. Uh, but it's, it's one of those things that we've got to respect the city and, and, and be compliant and understand that they're, they're trying to do their job to keep us in line, and that's hard. Some of us are easier than others. But we must respect them. It's, it's God's institution which we must respect. Okay, so we've got the government is in control. The government is God's idea. This is the hard part. We're to trust Him with them. We're to trust Him with them. God's in control. He's sovereign. The, he's behind the government, so we just we just trust Him with them. I pull this from Romans 13, verses 5 to 7. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of the possible punishment but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes. The authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. So you might be wondering where I got trust him with them out of this passage. I'm trying to find the, the best, most practical way to put this in action. And so we're, we're, not to, we're not to rebel. We're not to go after the government. Uh, you have situations like in the Protestant Reformation, uh, Luther was, was preaching this passage of scripture when, when there's a really bad government in place and there's all this kind of bloodshed. And we're, we're to respect the institutions. I say, if you respect the institution, when we can't respect the person. It's like saluting the rank in the military. And so we, we, we honor what God says we should do about the government, even when we don't feel like it, even when that person we hated is now the president of the highest office in the land here. So everyone in here is smart. And everyone in here is thinking of objections in your mind. What, what do you, like, what point in time do you stop respecting? Or I can't respect that person. Or are you really thinking of this person gets president? I can't respect that at all. Okay, so let's, let's move to a hypothetical situation. Ready? So who knows what these two candidates would do over four years? Who knows? That's, there's all kinds of unpredictability. We don't know what the future's going to hold. So, so let's walk through a scenario. Let's say that... We've had kind of a, a sexual revolution in these last four years and the redefinition of marriage. Let's say that things move forward. Let's, let's say that your body, you can do whatever you want with, so we're going to legalize prostitution. We're just going to do that because people should be told what they can or can't do with their bodies and someone wants to go sell themselves. You know, so let's say that they legalize prostitution. Let's say that, uh, you know, Christians, we don't like that. And so we start preaching out against, against prostitution. We start. We continue to say Jesus is the only way to heaven. We continue to, to proclaim Christ. So let's say that we get we start getting some real Christian persecution. And let's say it starts getting ugly. We start losing freedoms. They start taking away pulpits from us. They start closing the churches down. Uh, churches burn down. They start arresting pastors. Okay? So let's just work with me on this. Let's say they start doing that. Let's say that they, they just kind of say, hey, you know what? You're wealthy. You, if you notice, if you notice these days, there's a certain elite class, and if you have enough money, you can buy almost anything. So let's say that the wrong person gets in control, gets some lobbyists, and they start reinstituting slavery, and so people can. It's hypothetical, but let's say that people can start owning people, uh, and we do we do have slavery now, sex slavery, but it's not endorsed by the government. Let's say the government turns a complete blind eye to that and says it's all right. Let's say also, you know, these people in power don't want to give up power. 
President, you know, I think dictator sounds better. Maybe Fuhrer sounds better. So I'm just going to do away with the Senate if the Congress will have a token role. And let's say that not only am I, is this president a dictator, but let's say they just want to call themselves a god. And they want to ask people to worship them. They call themselves the son of the divine. You still with me? <laughs> That's, uh, I might have checked out after the first few because it just gets so ugly and so unrealistic so quickly for us. Thankfully, in four years, it, that's, that's just not going to happen. It better not happen. But let's say that, let's say that all that does happen. What a, terrible, what a terrible situation we'd be in, first of all. What would God want us to do? So let's say you've got prostitution going on, you've got slavery, you've got Christian persecution, we've got a dictator, democracy's gone on, and the government, the president, says, hey, you should worship me. What do you think the God would say then? Thoughts on that? At what point in time would you revolt? Okay. Let me tell you, without a shadow of doubt, what God would say. God would say, therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is why you pay taxes, the authorities are God's servants, who give their full time to governing. This was the Roman government at the time that Paul was preaching. This is what was happening. Caesar was considered a god. They were persecuting, killing Christians, sending them to lions, lighting them with torches. There was legalized slavery. People did not have rights. Women had zero rights. There was uh, prostitution, temple prostitution. That was all encouraged. The Senate had a token role, but the, the Caesar was the real was the real power. There's all kinds of ugliness there. So think about if if Paul, if God, if that's God's message from Paul, and God's message to the Romans at this point in time, that's a good message for us too today. That even in such a bleak situation, we should still submit. Now, you know, you know, I know there's people out there that are still objecting. That's fine. I've got objections to this as well. But let's turn to Scripture to get this solved. Out of Acts chapter 5, let's read this. This is a conversation between Peter and the Pharisees and the leaders of the law in Jerusalem. We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name, he said, in Jesus' name. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and we're determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. So there is an out. If the government says you are not to share the gospel, we know that clearly we're to obey God other than man. And so if you personally, if the government asks you to do something personally that is a complete violation of what you believe God is, is asking you to do, then you have moral grounds, biblical grounds, to rebel, of civil disobedience. And whether or not that involves baking a cake or signing a marriage certificate, that's a matter of conscience for that person. Uh, there's probably ways to do it that, that respects the authority, like resigning or asking to be changed or just simply making a statement, uh, as opposed to a rebellion. But here we have the grounds for civil disobedience is that when the government asks us to do something directly contradicting God's word. So, there are organizations that the government supports that I don't support whatsoever. Condone, uh, there's, there's, there's money that finds its way in the hands of terrorists. There's money that is used to slaughter the unborn. There, there's money that, that goes to other things that I don't support. That does not give me a right to stop paying taxes. It also does not give me a right to disrespect or to stop obeying the government. But if the government comes and knocks on my door and says, you got to stop preaching, I say, take me away. <laughs> there may come a time when it comes to that. The good news is the government's rise and fall. There's been no nation that's never fallen. They all have birth and death cycles. 
But the gospel has never failed. And so we are to align ourselves with the eternal government of whom Jesus is Lord, as opposed to fearing the temporal government. So, the 2016 Survival Guide, God is in control. Don't have to worry. Don't be afraid. God's got this. And over and over and over, as divisive as this election is, it'll be all right. You, know, you, you look at other nations around the world, and they would love to have a Clinton or a Trump. They really would. And it's, it almost sounds laughable, but I'm serious. They would love to have one of those two. There's so much corruption, so much politicking, there's so much murder. God's in control. We can trust him. Our hope is in him. Our hope is not in our government. He's in control. The government's God's idea, and it's our responsibility to submit to them. It does not give us a right to, to disobey. That doesn't, doesn't mean, I'm not saying don't vote or don't exercise your freedom of expression. That's a beautiful thing the government's built in. We should, we should have kind of freedom of expression. But not freedom of rebellion. We should not be like those people in Washington or Oregon who hold up with guns. and It's just a mess. We're to trust him with them. What I love is, is when it says that, that the government is God's servants, guess what? God, they're, they're responsible to God. Yeah, they're, they're, they're kind of responsible to me and to us because we put them there. And if we don't like what they're doing, we're going we're gonna to vote them out of office. But ultimately, they're responsible to God. So if they advance the agenda that we think is really unethical or evil, that costs us thousands and thousands of dollars every year, then that's on them. It's not on us. And because they're doing it, it's like... Okay, so, so a government organization is, is supporting this thing that's evil. And because I'm paying taxes, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not responsible. We're not responsible. So that should hopefully encourage you. So we see, and I, I'm, I don't want to get political, but I'll, I'll throw one issue out there just of abortion. Because Nathaniel had a personality before he was born. And Camilo recognized his personality and saved his life. And he stopped acting out of, he was very active and exploring and creative. And uh, when he settled down, he went to the doctor and found out he had a little cord wrapped around his neck and he was going to die unless we had a C-section. Uh, also things like, uh, before, before you created me, I knew you in the womb. And so there's definitely a connection there between the, the fetus, the embryo, and, and God. So that's my one political stance on day today. But that's not the only thing we take into consideration when we vote. But if we vote someone in office who holds that viewpoint, then that's on them. That's their decision. And they're responsible. And again, that's my that's my personal opinion. So what do we do? The survival guide's nice, but what do we do? What's a plan that we need that we can have moving forward this week? It's not hold up, uh, stockpile supplies. It's not go out, go out and buy guns and lots of ammo. First of all, if God's in control, we pray, pray. I've been kicking myself recently because I, I just, I don't pray enough. I, I feel like some standards I pray a lot, but I, I feel like I just don't pray enough. I pray before every single thing that we do, just in trusting, understanding God's in control, He's sovereign over all things. We need to pray our hearts out for our nation. There's all kinds of investigations going on with both candidates. So let's pray that God works a miracle and truth comes to light within the next couple days because there's a lot of you're saying there's a lot of speculation, there's a lot of accusations, but we don't know. And we don't want to put someone in, in office, and then again, they're both under investigation, and so I'm saying this about both. We don't want to put someone in office who would really lead our country astray. And so pray that truth comes to light. Pray that God relieves anxiety in our hearts, gives us peace. Again, that, that great passage out of Philippians, that don't be anxious about the election, but in everything, our prayer and petition present our requests to God and His peace to find all understanding will burn our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. If you find yourself, after going on Facebook or, or watching the news or, or just driving around, just thinking about the election, pray for peace. So pray for peace and God will answer that. He's in control. He loves us. He loves you. And we're going to be spending all eternity in heaven with Him under the best government the world has ever seen. And so, 
we can pray not only that the truth comes to light, but also to relieve anxiety in our hearts. Pray for wisdom for the other people that are voting. Pray for, for wisdom for the elected officials. Pray for honesty and truth and, and the election that, that that's pure. And that the person who is defeated respects the winner, whichever way it would go. And then also pray that God's will be done in us. It's interesting how many Christians are so concerned about religious liberty and they don't show the gospel. That is, it's, it's not, it's a, it's non secular, but it does not follow. Why would I be so concerned about my right to share that God, that Jesus is Lord, if I don't do it? And so, uh, maybe some persecution will help spark us to action. And so pray that, that God uses us. So prayer, we just need to be praying constantly. And then, I'm so excited about prayer night this week, it could not fall on a better time. Because we're going to be coming together as a congregation one day after these divisive elections are over. The news of our president-elect will be less than 24 hours old if we can come together and pray for peace for our nation, pray to respect and honor the establishment, pray for wisdom for whoever's elected. And so I strongly encourage you to join us here 5.30 next Wednesday for prayer. Can't think of anything to do that would be better. So first of all, pray. Uh, second of all, vote. Uh, a lot of this is, you could, almost, you could almost say it's fatalistic. Like, God's in control, He's going to handle it. And a lot, I know a lot of Christians are like, well, I'm just going to pray about this. God's given us an opportunity to make a difference, and your vote makes a difference. Even if it's just one tiny fraction of a percentage point for this county, we should still be voting. Uh, a stat that, that I saw recently, and this is from My Faith Votes, the website, and this is a great place to go, myfaithvotes.org. Last election was determined by 5 million votes, and yet 25 million Christians registered to vote did not in 2012. And so if the Christians were out in force, that might have made a difference in last year's election. We can sway the outcome. And so it's very important for Christians to vote, and I strongly urge everyone in here to vote. You might disagree with me and who you vote for. The only problem we'll have with you is if you don't vote. Or you don't vote and you don't pray. Uh, and so I strongly, as long as, as long as you vote for somebody and vote for somebody to vote for, then, then I, I encourage that. So go out and vote. And then lastly, respect. Remember, God's in control. God's put the government in control with us. They're stewards. There's no need for doom and gloom. If that person that you dread is elected on Tuesday, no need for doom and gloom. God's in control. We respect them. As if our hope can be anything other than Christ. That just, again, produces fear and anxiety and worry. And so vote and then respect how that outcome turns out. Don't despair. Don't worry. It'll be okay. So that, that's the challenge. And if you find yourself worrying and full of anxiety, it's probably because you're, you're trying to take control. It's going to be okay. I promise you. It's going to be okay. One of my, one of my favorite songs encourages, and, and we sing about the sovereignty of God, that this is God's world, that nothing happens outside of His control, that He's the one who's ordained the tides of the ocean, He's the one who has put everything in motion. And everyone is responsible for their own sin. Everyone is, is responsible for their own decisions. I'm, I'm responsible for my faults and my failures just as, just as much as any government official is for theirs. And so let's, let's stand and worship together as we sing the truth. This is God's world.